Welcome. Today is May 9th. It's a Thursday, 2019. My name is Mark Tapu. I am the Director of Oral History with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. And today is an exciting day for me because I get to talk to Susan Haig. Mm -hmm. How are you, Susan? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Tell me what your job is. I'm the curator here at the Lincoln Home. Uh, that means I take care of the house and all of the contents. Um, the artifacts that belong to the Lincoln as well as, as other pieces that we have in the collection. If you would, please tell me just a little bit about your education. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree uh, in historic preservation with an emphasis in museum studies. Uh, and then I also have a master's degree in historical administration, um, again, with an emphasis in museum studies. So um, I went to school to learn how to be a curator, but I've been here since 1991, um, longer than the Lincolns. So the Lincolns were here 17 years. I've been here almost 28. <laughs> Which means you must like this job. It's a pretty good job. It's never the same day twice. <laughs> So what is it that you especially love about the experience of working here? Partially because it is never the same day twice. Um, you get to meet people from all over the world, um, get to do fun things like this where we get to show people all over the world what the house is like. Um, and Lincoln's a pretty interesting guy and uh, his life in Springfield is not something that a lot of people know about. They know about President Lincoln, they don't necessarily know about Lincoln, the father, the husband, the local lawyer. And as we go through here, it's going to be a lot about the house. Yes. But it's going to be just as much about the home of Abe and Mary Lincoln. Right. And that's the exciting part for me to learn some of the backstory about them as well. But let's start with a little bit about the, the history and the origins of the house itself. Okay. The first part of the house was built in 1839. It was built as a one and a half story cottage. So that full second story you see was not there. Um, it was built by the Reverend Charles Dresser um, for he and his family. Uh, he was a local Episcopal minister here in town and he actually performed the wedding ceremony for Abraham and Mary Lincoln in 1842. They almost got married here in the house, um, but at the last minute it was switched to Mary's sister's house where Mary was living at the time. Um, so the house was about five years old when the Lincolns bought it. Um, they, they had the contract in January of 1844 and they moved in May 2nd, 1844, so just a few days ago. It's unusual that we should know precisely the date they moved in. Yes, that was the day they, they closed on the house. There's documentation. Um, and they moved in with their young son, Robert. He was about nine months old at the time. Um, their other three sons then were born in this house and their second son, Eddie, died in this house. So a lot happened here. Tell me about the construction itself, and especially once we get inside to look at the walls. I know that the construction of the, the type of walls that were built at the time is so different from what we would do today. Uh, when it was first built, the first floor um, was built called the heavy timber frame construction. Uh, so big pieces of logs, basically trees. Um, they used walnut, chestnut, hickory for the lath that the plaster was applied to. Um, and then when they built on the second floor in 1855, so almost 20 years later um, from the original building, it was all balloon frame construction like we have today, and it was all pine. So there's some very distinct differences between the first and the second floor. Um, it's built originally in the Greek Revival style. Greek Revival was very symmetrical, so you could basically cut this house in half and it'd be the same on both sides. Um, has a little bit of a kind of a Greek pediment around the front door. Um, kind of little decorative things across the windows, things like that. So that's the style. <laughs> um, lath and plaster walls? Lath and plaster walls, um, mostly that... with cow hair as the binding agent. Oh, really? Guernsey and Jersey cows, you can see the red in the, the hair. Did that require a lot of maintenance over the years? Not really. There's still quite a bit of the original plaster in the house. We've got about 60% overall of the, the total house. So 60% includes the siding, a lot of the plaster, the joists, the, the um, studs. One other thing I wanted to ask you before we actually go in the house, and that's why it sits up so high <laughs> from the level ground and then the steepness of the steps that we've got here. Part of that is natural. Um, the Lincolns, this corner lot was a little bit higher and the rest of the neighborhood does slope a little bit to the south uh, towards the town branch, the, the creek that was about three blocks away. Um, but you'll notice if you look at the other lots, there is a, a little bit of a knoll in all of their lots. Um, the Lincolns either chose to emphasize it or were losing their front yard. We're not sure which, but they did have the brick wall, retaining wall built. You and know what roughly year that would have been? I think, if I remember correctly, it was about 1854. Okay, so, so they've been about here the time for... they were adding okay. to the second floor too. 
and the steep steps. Steep steps uh, is just kind of a, a fact of nature. Not a lot of space and you got to get up quite a, a rise. So, And for Mr. Lincoln, it wasn't a problem. <laughs> Mrs. Lincoln might have had a few issues. She was only about 5'3", five, 5'4", five, yeah. but Mr. Lincoln had no problem with these yeah. steps at all. <laughs> okay, Susan, how about we head on inside then? Let's go inside. All right, come on in. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to start with, Susan, is a little bit about the entryway, because every room in this building is a little bit distinctive. So what comes to mind about this room for you? The first thing you see when you walk in the door is the stairwell. Um, and the newel post and handrail on that stairwell were the ones that were used by the Lincolns when they lived here. The thing that caught my eye, though, was that that doorbell. The doorbell, yes. <laughs> the doorbell is, as far as we know, original to the house. Um, it was a very simple spring and pulley system. You can see that the bell is hooked up to some wires that normally there'd be a wire here that attached to a uh, pull outside. So you just would pull on that button and it would cause the doorbell to ring. Was that typical of the day? Very typical of the day. Very okay. typical. And obviously the first thing that they would be concerned about for guests and probably for themselves, or Mary would be concerned, is taking the hat and coat off and uh, using the coat rack here. Correct. And the coat rack do did belong to the Lincolns as well. Probably one of the first things that they purchased when they moved into the house. It's a Gothic revival style piece of furniture, which is very popular in the 1840s here in the Midwest. And they moved in in 1844, 175 years ago. And uh, so that would have been one of the first things they would have bought. One of the things that we're going to talk about a lot as we go through here is the carpeting. It's a very ornate carpeting that you see here, even in the entryway. It is. Um, we don't know exactly what kind of carpet they had through most of the house. Um, we do know the pattern in the, the parlors, but the rest of the house is just what was popular at the time. I notice on the hat rack you've got Abe's hat. <laughs> well, uh, not exactly his hat, but the right size, the right style. Yeah, you couldn't afford his real hat. No, yet. we could not. <laughs> would the ladies have been wearing hats and put their hats there as well? They would not. Polite society, you would have kept your bonnet on. Usually it was a bonnet, something that came around your whole face. Um, occasionally in summer they'd have a, a lighter hat, like a straw hat. Um, but they would have put their shawl up there if they wanted to. The other thing they would have done, if you had particularly muddy feet, because the streets were just dirt or mud, um, the chair is there so that you could sit down, take off your muddy shoes, and put on the house slippers that you had carried oh. with you in a bag. So I bet Mary especially was concerned with that happening. She was very, very concerned about that, especially with some of the gentlemen and their big muddy feet. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, let's move on to the parlor. All right. Let's do that. Susan, front parlor. Before we get into any details here, I, I've got a couple general questions. Sure. First of all, how do we know that this is relatively accurate to what the Lincolns would have known at their time? We've got a couple of sources that tell us a little bit about the house. Um, the one thing we don't know about for sure are colors. But we do have a, a drawing from Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper that was done right after Mr. Lincoln was nominated in May of 1860. And that shows what the two parlors look like as well as the sitting room across the hall. We also have one photograph taken the day of Lincoln's funeral of the back parlor that gives us a nice clear view of the wallpaper. So. Okay, uh, what I'm looking at here, I mm -hmm. don't see the wallpaper illustrated, at least what right. the design of the wallpaper would be. We think the uh, artist ran out of time because this is pretty detailed wallpaper. But like I said, we've got the photograph from 1865 and we know that the tenants hadn't changed the wallpaper at that point. Uh, so we're pretty sure this is what the wallpaper looked like. There's flecks of gold in this wallpaper. There are flecks of gold. It's a little bit nicer wallpaper. Um, wallpaper was very fashionable, had been for over 100 years. A lot of it was coming from France or China. Those are the two main exporters. Um, and to have this little, the little flecks of gold in it helps to reflect the light. The lighting's pretty low in these days. So anything you can have to help reflect the light a little bit more. So is it just gold paint or is it gold leaf? This is gold paint. Um, it might have been gold leaf back then, but that would have been pretty expensive. And Mary was pretty economical when she was living here. So this probably was just gold paint. Okay. Well, the other thing you just mentioned was the lighting. Now, we've got good lighting here now. <laughs> yes. Something they would have probably never experienced. What was the lighting they would have had in the rooms at the time? Lighting at the time was candles um, or 
whatever you could get off of the fireplaces and the stoves. Um, there's no record of the Lincolns buying anything other than maybe a little bit of whale oil, which was another form of lighting, but again, very dim. No kerosene. Uh, natural gas lighting did not come here until the 1870s, long after the Lincolns were here. Electricity didn't get here until the early 1900s, so we're, we're a ways away from bright lights. It's just hard to imagine, though, what it was like in here when the only lighting source was a few candles. It is a little hard. Um, there was no chandelier, as far as we know, so it is pretty much limited to maybe the mantles. They would have most likely moved these to a center table if they were entertaining and, and then have that, because if it was left here, you run the risk of actually lighting the wallpaper on fire. Would they oftentimes move from room to room or head upstairs carrying a candle with them? Possibly. They would have had a, a not one of these. They would have would have blown these out and then had some other kind of just little okay. handheld candle, yes. Tell me about the candlesticks we've got on the mantle then. These are popular from the time period. Um, we do have some that belong to the Lincolns in the back parlor, but these particular ones um, depict a scene from a very popular French novel at the time, A Little Scandalous. Um, this is called Paul and Virginia was the name of the book. And if you've seen the movie Blue Lagoon from back in the early uh, 80s, you have seen Paul and Virginia. <laughs> it's the same storyline. Uh, young children shipwrecked in the South Pacific. You can see the palm leaves. Um, and mm -hmm. this is where they have been discovered and are being separated now. They've fallen in love and they're being separated. Are those original to the house at the time? They are not. They are just what was some, something that was available. And because Mary was um, fluent in French, she read French novels. Um, so this is just kind of a nod to her interests. Okay. As we move from room to room, there are a few original items, and I'm sure we will talk about that. But otherwise, have you just tried to get as close as you can to what the items would have looked like at the time? We have. If we have a record of it, um, like we do with, with the front parlor, we and fortunately we do have actually the furniture that belonged to the Lincolns. These pieces with the black horsehair fabric did belong to the Lincolns. They put them in storage across the street with one of the neighbors. He was a bachelor. I guess he didn't have a need for a lot of extra storage space, so they put him up in his attic. Um, the problem was when <laughs> he got married while the Lincolns were still in Washington and Mrs. Lincoln wrote back to one of the other neighbors and said, I hear Mr. Birch has gotten married. Does he want our stuff out of the, out of the house? Mm -hmm. So apparently he was okay with it because it came back later. The other curiosity in the room here is the fireplace because it doesn't <laughs> really look like the fireplace I would have expected to see. Uh, no, this is the popular thing to do at the time was as you were converting to the more modern technology was you would just leave your fireplace mantle and attach your fireplace straight to that. This is a wood burning fireplace, um, a wood burning stove I should say, and um, very popular parlor stove of the time. The um, original parlor stove is actually up in Dearborn, Michigan at Greenfield Village, but uh, this is a pretty close match compared to the, the drawing and probably was much more efficient in heating the room at a, at a standard rate. Much more efficient, much, yeah. You didn't need nearly as much wood to get a lot more heat. And it didn't all go up the chimney like a fireplace. Right. How about the ceramics that I see in the mantle there? Uh, period pieces, uh, again, popular at the time. Um, a lot of the smaller furnishings, the glass, the, the china, did not survive from the Lincoln time. Um, broke, was given away, sold, whatever the case may be. And like us today, the pictures on the wall tell a story as well. So let's start with George and Martha, I assume. Washington. Yes, George and Martha Washington, um, very popular, obviously, at the time. Um, not personal friends. We get that question periodically. No, George Washington had died 10 years before Lincoln was born. So um, you didn't put big pictures of your family up because that wasn't available. That format wasn't available. So you put pictures of people you especially admired. So George and Martha Washington are a good choice for the Lincolns. The other pictures are a little bit more of a surprise to me. You've got the ones over your shoulder mm -hmm. here. Um, a wildflowers, it looks like. They are, they're watercolors. Okay. Um, again, uh, probably just something pretty. They, they weren't really sure what should be there. But. And how about the one over in the corner? <laughs> the one in the corner is a hair wreath. And that a was a popular, yeah, popular hobby for young ladies of leisure. Um, of course, ladies had very, very long hair, and when you'd comb out your hair, you would save whatever the loose hair was in a hair receiver. There was actually a specific container for it, and um, eventually then you would take that and kind of twist it into 
yarn basically and crochet these lovely flowers. Sometimes it would be in memory of somebody, um, perhaps when someone died you received a lock of their hair. Um, very popular if you were maybe moving away, you'd get locks of hair from all your friends. Um, but just a popular hobby at the time. Is this something that can be directly tied to the Lincoln family? Sadly, no. We don't know whose DNA we have on the wall there. <laughs> but it would have been something that Mary would have done? She may have. She may have. Okay. Well, the mirror. I mean, that's a distinctive mirror. I guess you couldn't hardly walk through the, the house without seeing your reflection someplace. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, again, this is a very popular thing to do style-wise, uh, very fashionable to have a large mirror with a marble top table underneath, and that the marble top table did belong to the Lincolns. Well, carpeting in here, again, is very distinctive. You, know, it is. you, you look at it today and you say, my gosh, <clears throat> it's gaudy. But that was the style at the time. Very much, it? yeah. The, the carpet pattern does show up in the Leslie drawing. It also shows up in that photograph from 1865. The only thing we can't tell is what the colors were. Um, We've had somebody point out this is the same color as Mary Lincoln's White House china, which is, I, I think, just a coincidence, except that Mary was very fond of purple. So this, this is kind of purpley. This time frame that they're living here, in this 1840s all the way up until he's elected president, Right. was that the early stages of the Victorian era? It was very early stages, Victorian. Um, the full, the overblown um, the scarves and everything and and just lots of little knickknacks was after the Civil War, 1870s, 1880s. So this is a lot simpler time. Um, and again, Mary, Mary's pretty economical here. She doesn't have a lot of money to, to play with. So, for example, the, the horsehair furniture looks very elegant, but the horsehair is very durable. It, it really wears like iron, practically. So she had a very practical streak to her as well. Yeah, I guess it's, I don't know the first thing about horsehair furniture. It looks <laughs> awfully smooth in terms of the covering of it. it obviously, the, the craftsman would have worked with it quite a bit. Yes, yes. It's, well, it's very smooth in one direction. If you go with the nap, it's very smooth. If you go against it, it's like Velcro. Was it subtle or was it pretty stiff? It could be pretty stiff depending on the weave. Um, and If there was a pattern, you could get a, a pattern in it. These don't happen to have it. But Okay. Mm -hmm. And Oh, lots of things I wanted to talk about because your eye is certainly drawn to the two whatnots. I guess that's what they're called. Right. They are, um, there's the flat back whatnot that did belong to the Lincolns. The corner whatnot, this is a period piece. The original is up in the Chicago History Museum. Um, and this has just been a place to display um, knickknacks that you had collected, perhaps, or things that you were interested in. For example, we've got William Shakespeare and Charles Dickens. On this shelf, we've got Robert Burns in the corner. Um, those were authors that the Lincolns liked to read. Um, Lincoln actually got to go hear Charles Dickens speak when he was doing his American tour after A Christmas Carol was published. Really? We don't know if they met. Lincoln would have just been a country lawyer at the time, nobody, in, nobody important. So, um, but we do know he went to hear the, the talk. <laughs> and then one thing that is unusual is the bust of Lincoln himself. It did exist. It, this is not the exact one. But um, yes, the, the sculptor, Leonard Volk, was from Chicago. He came down and uh, did a life mask and hands of Lincoln, intending to make a, a life-size bust of him, um, as well as Stephen Douglas. It was in honor of the Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1858. So that was done before the election of 1860? Yes, just barely. Okay. Um, and so then he came down and presented a small version of it. He was, I should say a uh, disclaimer, Leonard Volk was Stephen Douglas's brother-in-law. So it was partially okay. a family thing, but also because he admired both people. And what are the books on the whatnot? Uh, these are books from the time period. Uh, there's Harper's Weekly, um, Gibbon's Rome, which was a travel log of going to Rome and Italy. Harper's Weekly was a popular publication at the time. Um, Godey's Ladies Book, um, books on agriculture, biographies. They, they like to read. So we have a lot of different types of books here. This is the front parlor. Yes. Is this a room that the Lincolns would have used a lot or only when company was here? This is an only when company was here room. Um, the doors would have been closed off for the most part to keep the, the boys, the dogs, the cats, whatever else the boys would have brought with them. Um, these you kept nice for company. So. As we move from room to room then, uh, the doors and the woodwork 
Uh, what wood would have been used at the time? These are black walnut, and they did belong, they were here when the Lincolns were here. Um, fireplace as well? And the fireplace as well. The door frames are also the original door frames, um, but the Lincolns covered those up. They're also black walnut, but they painted them white. Um, unfortunately, it's beautiful wood. But <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the idea was perhaps Mary could entertain here in the front parlor. Mr. Lincoln could then shut these double doors and maybe meet with a, a political ally or a legal client back here in the back parlor if he needed to, and the boys could be playing somewhere else. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. in this room is the curtains or drapes. I don't know what term would have been used at the time. Either is fine. And they also look very heavy and ornate. And with you, when you talk about not having very much light, it strikes me that that's not helping the situation. <laughs> Well, there's a couple of reasons for the heavy drapes. Uh, because this was not used a lot, this, these rooms were not used a lot, you would close the drapes to keep the furniture and the carpet from fading. Um, while there was a, the chemical dyes were first starting to be used, so they were a little more stable, there still was a lot of vegetable dye in use, so, and that fades very quickly in sunlight. So you close up the, the drapes when this room isn't in use and keep it dark, much like we still do now. Um, just to help with the fading. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next parlor that we've got we at home. All right. Susan, we're now in the rear parlor. What would the family have called it at the time? Uh, rear parlor, back parlor. Uh, when they first moved into the house, though, this room didn't exist. Um, the front parlor was here, as well as a sitting room and then a large kitchen off the back. Um, but the sleeping lofts upstairs were only about six foot six at their highest point. And I think Mr. Lincoln got tired of hitting his head. So they cut off the kitchen wing and moved it six feet to the south and built this room on actually as a bedroom initially. So this was the bedroom where at least three of the boys, well, the three younger boys were born here. Uh, little Eddie, their second son, died in this room um, shortly before, right after his fourth birthday. Um, and they had the funeral in the front parlor. So at the time, they didn't have these big double doors. That was added when they put the full second floor. Um, moved all the bedrooms upstairs and made this a, a much grander space. When did that uh, addition happen? The main second floor uh, started in 1855 and then they finished by 1866, 1856, sorry, uh, putting on the full second floor. That's a long time in construction for somebody like Mary to have to put up with all of it, I would think. She did, but I think she enjoyed it. Mr. Lincoln was gone a lot of the time, so she was basically the general contractor while he was gone, which is a pretty big deal. Okay. Well, one of the things that you mentioned when we first went through here was an existence of a well. There was a well. Like I said, when this, this room wasn't here, the well was kind of back in this area. There was a porch, and um, you'd walk out from the kitchen into that. This was the actually outside door, so the well was kind of back here to get to that. It's still there. Um, it's filled, but it's still there. And again, candlesticks we're going to see in every room. Are there anything right. distinctive about this collection? These three candlesticks did belong to the Lincolns. Um, you'll notice they're a little bit plainer than the ones in the front parlor, but still nice. I mean, they still have the crystal dangly uh, pieces. Um, they're brass with a marble base, so they're, they're still nice. They're just not maybe the absolute top of the line. Well, here's a peculiar question. I wonder how long the candlesticks would last because you would be using candles an awful lot. They must have gone through a lot of candles during the year. They did go through a lot of candles. The, um, the lists uh, from the, the local stores, I, almost oh, probably every two weeks maybe, they were buying candles. Okay. So. And the ceramics on the, uh, on the ceramics, mantle? Ceramics, again, um, very popular from the time period, but not directly belonging to the Lincolns. Um, they're interesting, though. They show scenes of hunting um, and actual snipe shooting which is kind of a, you know, a joke nowadays, but this is actually snipe hunting in one of the scenes. That is kind of interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Well, we talked about the curtains in the last room. Tell me about the valances, because those are also very ornate. They are. Uh, these particular valances were replaced in the 1950s, um, but you can see in the drawings that they, they do exist at the time. Um, they were made of hammered brass. It was a thin sheet of brass. It was placed over a mold and then hammered into place to get that nice ornate design. Okay. Any original furniture in this room? 
Well, we have the, the sofa behind me, which is nice and long for Mr. Lincoln to, to spread out if he wanted to stretch out and read the newspaper back here. I'm still thinking he'd have to prop his feet up, though. He would, yes. It's not quite long enough for him, um, but longer than some of the other furniture. Um, we also have the, the bookcase in the corner. Um, we've got one book in here that belonged to the Lincolns. We have a few more in the collection, but they're unfortunately not in great shape. Um, but again, lots of different topics. Um, weekly or monthly newspapers, Godey's Ladies Book, like I said, um, travelogues, biographies, Shakespeare, Dickens. What's the original book that you've got? We've got The Life of Black Hawk, it's called. It's uh, Chief Black Hawk. That Lincoln was um, a captain in the Black Hawk War, so that's probably the appeal. Wanted to learn a little bit more. He was always very interested in learning about his enemies. Um, he, you know, famously said, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. So he liked to learn about other people that he was maybe opposed to for some reason. Mm -hmm. I noticed that there is another drawing here that's in front of this table. Mm -hmm. So we know roughly what this room would have looked like as well. Right. Um, this room, the drawing here, you'll notice there's a few things that we've added. We've added a central table that it was a very fashionable thing to do at the time. Um, the Lincolns had had a party the night before these drawings were done, so we think maybe some of the pieces had been pull, pushed to the walls or taken out just for more space. Okay. The fireplace is, it doesn't look operational now, was it at that time? <laughs> it was. Um, again, well, <clears throat> the drawings were done in May of 1860, so the fireplace in theory may not have been in use at that point anymore, so they had what's called a fire plate, um, and that just keeps things from falling down the chimney and into the house, um, keeps the drafts down as well. And that's cast iron and very heavy, so we don't take it out too often. <laughs> Tell me about the items that are on the table. On the table we have a reproduction of Lincoln's lap desk. We do have the original lap desk. Um, it's a very popular uh, item that we loan to a lot of different locations, so we had a reproduction made um, so that we could loan the original out. We've got some papers from Around, around Springfield and actually mostly Morgan County, so Jacksonville. Um, again, more books that they liked, some of the newspapers from the time period. Mr. Lincoln uh, received five or six newspapers a week. He just, he liked to be aware of what was going on in the country. So one came from Louisville, um, several were from Springfield area. He actually owned a German language newspaper from here in town. Uh, of course, the German population was very high. Um, they were mostly up in the north side um, near what is now the state fairgrounds, um, it's where a lot of them were living. And there were some in the neighborhood as well that he, he was friends with. You mentioned that he had a, a few or a couple from the Springfield area, so I assume one would be a Democrat paper and one a Whig paper? Uh, yes, he had both, the, as far as we know, he had both the um, journal and the register um, delivered. Obviously, he leaned more towards the Whig or the Republican paper eventually, but yes, he liked to, he liked to read as much as he could on, on all sides. Mm -hmm. And what's the box that I see on the table there? Oh, the box is his quills, and um, of course that is your only main writing instrument. Um, if you were fortunate, you would have a steel pen nib, but most day-to-day -day was just done with goose feathers. And I want to go back to your discussion about the lap desk. Yes. And I guess I wasn't aware that they had such a thing at the time. How would that be used? And it sounds rather obvious, but how would it be used? Well, much like a laptop today, um, it folds in half. You, obviously, you could put the papers underneath um, to store them. There's also room for quills. There's room for an inkwell, um, wax seals that you could have used to seal it up. Fold it in half and stick it in the saddlebag and go on your merry way. So would they... Would they use that when they're traveling, or would they use that at home rather than a table, or is it a little bit of both? A little bit of both. Um, Mr. Lincoln was gone three months in the spring and three months in the fall traveling the 8th Judicial Circuit, mm -hmm. so he probably just had things that he just always kept in here with him, legal papers and things like that. So sometimes maybe if he was going to work at home or meet with a client here, he could just pull out the laptop, laptop, lap desk <laughs> and start working with the client. Boy, it's tough not to convert to modern It days, is. It's it? very hard sometimes. <laughs> okay, one other thing I definitely want to ask you about in this mm -hmm. room, and it's so distinctive, and it surprised me to see it here, and those are the globes. The globes. They show up in the drawing. There's also several newspaper descriptions from the time. 
that talk about the, the two globes. And one of them is terrestrial, back in the corner, that's the land one. And then the other one is celestial, so that is um, the stars. So, well, you can see them. They were, these are not the Lincoln's Globes. We have no idea what happened to those, but uh, these were made in London in 1800. Um, and an interesting thing on the terrestrial globe, because they were made in London, they call the Atlantic the Western Ocean because it's west of London. That is interesting. And, it, you know, it's interesting, too, to, to know that they had a celestial globe. They did. And here's my thought on it. You've got candlelight inside. You don't have all these lights outside that are drowning out the night sky. Right. The, the Lincolns were very interested in natural sciences. Um, and I think they were really trying to, to teach their boys a little bit more. I don't know how much natural science they would have been picking up in their schooling. Um, so they liked to give them all the advantages that they could. So a celestial globe that would teach you um, the different constellations would be a nice thing to have for your, for your growing family. Okay, Susan, let's head to the dining room. Let's go to the dining room. Susan, the dining room. Now, it might sound obvious, but how would the family use the dining room? Dining room, well, originally when they bought the house, this was one big kitchen with a fireplace on this wall over here. And like I was saying, in the back parlor, um, they wanted to put a bedroom on here, so they cut off this, and you can see the cuts in the, the joists over here, slid this over. Um, you can still see the remnants of the two outside doors. Uh, that would have led to those porches, um, which is why this is such a long window. It's the only window that does that in the house. But uh, when they added the second floor, Mary then later added a wall in between, so she got a formal dining room, which is something she would have been used to growing up in a lot more luxury and a lot more wealth in Lexington, Kentucky, versus Abraham Lincoln in his one-room log cabin 180 miles away. Um, so the dining room would have been used pretty much every day. Um, it's hard to imagine because the railings do take up so much space, but this would have been a very nice sized dining room for a family of five. Um, they would have occasionally had visitors for dinner, but generally you did your visiting after dinner. Um, would the boys have their breakfast here as well? They might have. They probably would have had something here. Um, there was a small table to eat in the kitchen, but it would have been very crowded. So they may have had breakfast in there, but most meals would have been in here. The thing you can't avoid as we go through here, and it's obvious, it's obvious why they exist, are the railings. I wonder right. if you can tell us a little bit about the purpose and the function of the railings. Railings were actually put in by the state of Illinois in the 1920s, the original set. Um, because there were so many visitors coming through and um, things were starting to get pretty worn out. Um, so they did put railings in. The state then upgraded them in the 1950s. Uh, they did a, a huge restoration in 1952 to 54 and opened up the second floor for the first time. Bef prior to that, you just did a front loop and out the door. Um, so when they added those railings back in the 1950s, they did a very clever thing. In the bases, they ran the heating system. And then in 1987-88, when the Park Service did the, their last restoration, we maintained that, that setup, um, adding air conditioning. So the first time this house had air conditioning was 1988. How about but electricity? Well. When was electricity brought into the house? <laughs> first electricity that we can document was 1899. They did the doorbell, of all things. And then later on, I think about <laughs> seven, eight years later, they added a few more things of electricity. Um, Fully wired probably in the 1920s, they're yeah. about to get everything in. That would be quite a challenge for an old house like this. It would have been. Um, yeah, we can still see some of the original holes in the walls. Um, now in the 87, 88 restoration to maintain as much of the original plaster as we could, we took the siding off the outside and came in from the outside to do any kind of upgrades. Let's go back to the 1850s and wonder sure. if you can tell me about the table and chairs that we've got. Okay, uh, in 1850s, <laughs> the Lincolns would have sat around this table, possibly. Um, it is a gate leg table in that the, this is only about two feet wide, and then the, the wings come up, can and we, so those can drop down. Can we peek under the tablecloth? Oh, uh, we can chance? try. <laughs> okay. So you can see the seam. So these, the leg would have swung like a gate to close, and then giving you a little bit more room if you needed it in this room. The chair, these two chairs did belong to the Lincolns as well. Um, they're called fancy painted chairs or the, 
the brand name at the time was a Hitchcock chair because there was a Hitchcock factory in Massachusetts, I believe, that um, made this, this type of chair. These are not specifically Hitchcock, but they are very similar in style. And they're painted with, again, a little bit of gold leafing or gold paint. And I know one of your least favorite parts of the room here is the <laughs> china set here. But yeah. it looks like a good china set. It is. It's a, it's a good china set. It was very popular at the time. The uh, pattern is Chelsea grape. You can see little grape clusters everywhere. But this is not what the Lincoln's china would have looked like. Um, their china would have been either plain white, um, like we have some plates over here, not the Lincoln's, but similar, or they would have had this very um, ornate pattern to them that would have been transferred on it. It would have been inked onto the plate and then it was fired. The transfer print um, was very colorful, very durable, uh, very popular. It was kind of the false graph, I guess, if you can use a brand of the, of the time. It was very middle class, solid for, um, china. This is a little bit nicer set. Um, the plain white, very elegant, would have been a little bit thinner, more of a china, less of a pottery kind of china, would have been a little bit nicer, but your everyday would have been more of this transfer print wear, which we do not have, unfortunately. We just have pieces from the privy that were thrown out. But with some rambunctious boys, I bet there was some breakage. There was a lot of breakage, um, which is why we don't have any of the original china now. We just have pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, when something broke, you threw it out into the privy. Um, if it wasn't organic, if it was organic, you threw it in the streets and the pigs would eat it. That was the sewer system at the time. If it wasn't organic, it went out to the privy. How about the uh, crystal goblets? I guess that's what you might call those. Uh, yeah, the, they, these are water glasses in particular. Um, they are based on an original piece we found about this much in the privy. Um, and we're able to find some uh, antiques that were very similar. Would that be what they would use day to day when they're drinking sure. water? Mm -hmm. You would have had a lot of glasses. You would have had a pitcher on the table to drink a lot. Okay. <laughs> they did drink a lot of water. And the item that all of this china is sitting on, what was? <clears throat> what is that? That's called a, a sideboard or a break front was another term for it. Um, just a practical serving and storage piece. Uh, not a Lincoln piece, but again, an antique. Well, the other thing that catches my eye is right up there in the corner, and yet another mirror in the house. Yes. <laughs> and the clock. Clock is a time period piece. Um, it's actually one of our older pieces. It was initially made sometime in the 1750s or 60s, I believe. Okay. But not a, a Lincoln piece. How about the wallpaper here? Because this is very different from some of the other rooms. This, is, again, is a popular... Um, style that was available at the time. It's my favorite. I just, it's very spring. It's very bright, very colorful. Um, I think it would have been something Mary would have enjoyed. Mary was a very bright and colorful person herself, so she liked to have surroundings that reflected that. Okay, those are terms that I haven't heard used a lot for Mary in the past, <laughs> which she is was, nice to hear. Yes, yes. She definitely was a very popular young lady. Um, she had a lot of suitors. Stephen Douglas, of course, being one of them. Um, Abraham Lincoln, obviously, um, but yeah, she was she was a very she was a belle. Okay, now <laughs> the picture over here of the of the landscape is kind of what I was expecting to see more of in the house. Mm -hmm. This was uh, by Thomas Cole, um, a pop again very popular print. Um, it was a four picture series, The Voyage of Life, uh, went through the four stages of man. We're a little off. We're supposed to have the next stage. This is stage two. We're supposed to have stage three. There's a, f a photograph taken shortly after Lincoln's funeral that shows it on the wall. We're not sure which room. Um, weren't able to find stage three, so we have stage two. But it's a, an allegory of the young man setting off into life, and he's being guided and blessed by an angel. He's headed towards... I'm not sure what this is supposed to be. It looks like the Taj Mahal vaguely, um, but it's, I guess, oh, yes. manhood or something. I'm not sure what that's supposed to exactly be, but there's a little poem that goes with it. Very popular at the time. How about the other picture? Because <laughs> that's a surprise. The dead ducks. Uh, that is, uh, again, a popular piece. I think it's kind of unappetizing, but um, that was something that they would have had. Um, I don't know why. That's one of the things I don't quite understand from the time period. Some, some of the tastes did not translate to the, 
the current age, and that's one of the things I don't get. Is that not an original, or it's? It's an antique. It is an antique. But somewhere along the line, uh, the decision was made to display that here because that was typical of the time? Typical to have something like that in your dining room. You wouldn't have had that anywhere else. That was a dining room piece, which is, again, one of those tastes that I don't understand translated to the current mm -hmm. age. But. By the time you get into the 1850s, Abraham Lincoln is a man on the, on the up. He's, yes, he is. And so I'm wondering, they must have been doing a lot of entertaining. How much entertaining would they have done here in the dining room for formal dinners? Uh, they wouldn't have done a lot of formal dinners. Um, would have done more of an open house um, effect. So you would walk in the front door, meet Mr. Lincoln maybe in the parlors, come through, grab a, a few snacks maybe here. Mary might have been in here or she might have been in the sitting room. Um, to help kind of keep people moving. Chatted with her, chatted with some of your other friends or whatever, and then out the door. So total time you could have spent here maybe as short as 15 minutes. But it was a C and B scene kind of thing. Um, For those kind of events there, I would assume there'd be some kind of food. Lots of food. And drink available. Yes, yes. Um, Mary was, was eventually very well known for her southern cooking. Um, which she would have obviously picked up while she was living in Kentucky. Um, she also had three of her sisters here in town to help her. Um, they would have loaned their kitchens, their, uh, their ice boxes, their pantries. They would have also loaned her their servants. Mary did not have a servant generally um, that would have been able to do this kind of serving. She would have had a kind of a maid of all work, but um, for the formal serving, she would have maybe had to borrow from her sister Elizabeth, who was married to the son of the governor at one time, so a little more elegant. Um, How did four girls from Kentucky, four Todd sisters, end up in Springfield, Illinois? <laughs> Elizabeth, the oldest, uh, she is the oldest of the, the first set of six Todds. Um, and she got married at the age of 16 to a student who was going to Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky, where they were living. And he was the son of the Illinois territorial governor. So after they got married and he finished school, they came up here to Springfield to live with his family. And um, Elizabeth decided that this was a good place for her younger sisters to meet an eligible gentleman because this was still kind of the Wild West and men outnumbered women but in large quantities. So she brought up her sisters one at a time and married them off. So <laughs> they weren't so sure that her second sister, Frances, came up, married a doctor, William Wallace pretty happy with that. Then they brought Mary up. She didn't really know what she wanted to do, so she went back to Lexington for a time, came back up, stayed this time, met, like I said, several several um, suitors, really liked this Abraham Lincoln guy. The rest of the family was not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't think he was going to amount to much. He was kind of still very rough and very country bumpkin-esque, um, but she held her ground and got married and did okay. <laughs> Which of the sisters married Ninian Edwards? That was Elizabeth. That was okay. the oldest. Um, like and said, the Ninian Edwards home was in existence during the time they were courting? Yes. Yes. They courted at the Ninian Edwards home, which was on the corner of 2nd and Edwards. Unfortunately, no longer there. Um, but uh, yes, that was, it was a very popular social spot in Springfield. Um, the Edwardses were known for their entertaining um, and Lincoln actually came to a party there with his new law partner, um, which was John Todd Stewart, a cousin of the Lexington Todds, and um, so met Mary there. And he gazed on her, what was the quote? Something about he gazed on her as if bewitched, I think is the quote <laughs> from Elizabeth, that he just was kind of dumbstruck by Mary. So again, Mary yeah. was very bright and colorful. <laughs> yeah. Well, she certainly had a presence. She did. <laughs> and there is one of the sisters, I believe, also lived for a time in the uh, Rachel Lindsay home. What is now? Yes. That is Mary's younger sister, Anne. Um, and Mary <clears throat> never really got along with Anne because when Mary was born, she was called Mary Anne. Then when Anne was born, she had to give up that part of her name. And she always resented Anne for that, um, which I find interesting. But anyway, <laughs> Anne married Clark Smith, who was a uh, uh, very well-to-do uh, store owner, businessman here in town, and they, yes, they lived over on 5th Street in what is now the Vachel Lindsay State Historic Site home. Okay. Right. I think it's time now to move on to the sitting room. We'll go to the informal parlor or the sitting room, yes. Okay. 
Susan, we're in the sitting room now. It strikes me now we've got a front parlor, a rear parlor, a sitting room. They all kind of look similar to me. How was this room used? This room was used a lot more often than the parlors. This was the informal side of the house where the family would gather after dinner. Um, we know Mr. Lincoln liked to stretch out on the floor. He would probably be reading a newspaper or a book aloud for the general education of the room. Um, Mary could sit over there by her sewing table. That's the best light in the house. It's a southern and a western exposure. Um, so she could do a lot of her sewing with three boys and Mr. Lincoln at any one time in the house. Lots of buttons lost, lots of torn knees, uh, holes in socks, things like that. So she could sit over here and do a lot of her sewing. Um, if they had people here visiting, Mr. Lincoln maybe wouldn't be on the floor, but they could entertain in here with really good friends. And this also looks like a room that you had a pretty good feel for what it actually looked like at the time. Right. Well, this is the last room that we have a drawing um, from Frank Leslie's Illustrated, so we were able to identify almost everything. The one thing we can't identify is what would be here. It's in, there's something in the picture, but we don't know what that is, so that's why there's nothing here now. The fireplace also stands out to me because this is not a covered fireplace. It might have been actually used as a fireplace. Oh, yes, this was actually used as a fireplace as far as we could tell. Um, not only is it a, a plain fireplace without a stove in the drawings, um, but Mr. Lincoln made a comment that he could think better if he could, he was kind of mesmerized by the flames of an open fireplace, kind of calmed him down, um, gave him a chance to really think things through. And that was a very important aspect of Mr. Lincoln's personality. One of the other things that jumps out at you is you're standing here looking at the room, looking at the big picture, the wallpaper, the <laughs> carpeting. <laughs> there are actually seven different patterns if you count it, starting with the border at the top, the wallpaper, the valances, there's a little subtle pattern in the, the curtains, carpet, this little uh, throw rug, and the tablecloth. That's a lot of different patterns. Harmony through contrast was the, the fashion word of the day. So you'll notice they all have red, so there is a connecting color, um, except for the valances, of course. But yeah, so there's a red-green kind of thing going on. Um, but have been very, very popular at the time. What is the general impression you get from today's public about these kind of items, the, the wallpaper and the carpeting especially? Um, for some people, it takes some getting used to. Some people really love it. Um, a lot of times what we say is, well, think of the 1970s. That wasn't exactly a, a calm, quiet time for fashions and, and home decor. I mean, that, you know, it, it's not harvest gold and avocado green, but there was a lot of pattern then too. So it's just kind of a, a cycle. Would I be alone in the uh, one of the people going through today and say, oh my gosh. <laughs> no, most people think this is a lot to take in. And then we go upstairs to the bedrooms and the wallpaper there is even more <clears throat> figured and kind of garish. The, uh, the wicker uh, rocking chairs look very familiar. They look like they could come out of anybody's home today. They do. Um, these are reproductions based on the original. Um, there is one original that we know of. It's down at Tuskegee Institute. Um, George Washington Carver came for a visit back in the early 1900s, and the state was so thrilled that he came to visit, they gave him one of Lincoln's rocking chairs. So it's down at Tuskegee, <laughs> and we have reproductions here. Well, that is interesting. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about the table here, the game table you've got here. Right. Uh, besides uh, Mr. Lincoln on the floor, the boys could have been playing. Um, they may have been wrestling with their dad or playing with the dogs or the cats. Um, they could have been looking in this. This is a stereoscope, and this did belong to the Lincolns. Um, this was a pretty nice toy. It cost approximately $20 at the time, which for a family who maybe made $500 a year as an average, this would have been out of their reach. Mr. Lincoln was doing very well. He was basically the corporate lawyer for the Illinois Central Railroad by this time, so he could afford a very nice toy for his boys. Um, but you can see some of the cards on the table, and basically you put the card in, look through the eye holes, and it creates a vaguely three-dimensional effect. I mean, we kind of laugh at that three-dimensional now, but it was pretty exciting for them. So. That was, it's the early days of photography. It was the early days. And, and I'm wondering what kind of pictures then they would have been looking at. Um, well, some of the th things from around the world, um, we've got St. Paul's Cathedral in, in London, we've got the pyramids and the Sphinx in Egypt, um, Niagara Falls was a popular topic, 
Um, but then we also have a four mule team from Springfield. This was just a local picture. Um, or ice storms or uh, again the pyramids. Um, so just different topics, whatever a photographer mm -hmm. wanted to make, uh, to photograph and then sell. And chess, was that something that the family would have been playing? We know Lincoln played chess. Um, we think he was teaching his boys because there was a head of one of the pawns found out in the backyard. It was broken. We only had about this much of a, a piece to go off of. But um, thanks to the World Chess Hall of Fame down in St. Louis, we were able to identify what the pattern was and get it reproduced. So this is based on the original piece from the backyard. So in the dirt in the backyard. In the dirt in the backyard. Yeah, that one was not in the privy. Well, that <laughs> strikes me. You folks love to dig around in old privies, don't you? We do. We do love the, the privies give us the greatest information. Um, like I said, if it wasn't organic, it was thrown in the privy. So we have broken glass. We have broken china. We have a lot of the bones of the foods they would have eaten. So we know they ate sirloin. We know they ate a lot of turkey and chicken and pork based on what bones were in there. Um, some of the seeds that didn't necessarily um, disintegrate. So um, there's raspberry seeds and gooseberry seeds and different things like that. So we can learn a lot about their diet from what's in the privy. And here is another room where a mirror plays a prominent role. <laughs> it, was a, it was a Lincoln piece. It is a Lincoln piece. And um, partially because um, it helps reflect the light. So you could put a candle in front of that and you get double the candle power. Um, may have helped reflect some of the ambient light in the room for Mary while she was sewing. Um, would they sometimes then have a mirror over the fireplace as well? Uh, some, some houses would. The Lincolns did not for whatever reason. Um, and this is another one of those where this candlestick or this type of candlestick would not have been left here with the candles because it would have clearly set the wallpaper on fire. You would have taken that off and put it on the, the table to help you with, you know, playing checkers or chess or whatever. How and much, it's also, oh, go ahead. How much time would Lincoln spend in the room then? Um, most evenings. He probably would have been here. If he didn't have some other activity, this would have been where they would have gathered just as a family. So he and the boys together and Mary would all be in the room together? And Fido and a couple of cats and maybe one of the neighbors if they were stopping by for a few minutes. Um, this room also is a very important room at Christmas. This is the mantle that they would have hung their stockings from. So no Christmas tree that we know of, but Santa did come and visit and you can see there's still some nail holes oh, in the mantle nice. where they would have hung their stockings. Would this be about the extent of what Christmas decorations they would do? Most likely. Um, there wasn't a lot of commercial decorations available. It would have been um, natural things, so pine garlands and cranberries and, and uh, maybe some holly sprigs. When you say they were hanging stockings, they're actual stockings or they purchased something specifically for the season? No, they would have probably um, stolen them from their mother. Hers would have been the longest um, because lady stockings, of course, had to go all the way up to about mid-thigh. Um, so that would have been lots of room for all those goodies. Um, dad's stockings, you know, they're too short. They don't want those. So, yeah, it would have been some sort of stocking that they borrowed from mom. I'm sure she was thrilled. <laughs> and it does strike me it has the best light because of its position in the house and, and the direction on all. Would this be the room then that Lincoln would do a lot of his reading? He probably would have done a lot of his reading. Again, best light, um, the most candles in any of the rooms that shows up in the drawings. So, uh, yeah, very likely would have been the room he spent more time in. I think you mentioned the kind of books that uh, Abraham liked to read. Mary had the same um, tastes in reading? She had similar tastes. Um, she was a little more prone to novel reading. Um, so, like I said, French novels. She could read French fluently, um, but she also liked biographies. Um, and some of the, the heavier tomes um, that Mr. Lincoln may have read, but uh, maybe not all of them. I know that she also was politically ambitious for her husband. Mm -hmm. Does that mean she'd be reading the newspapers and following along with that as well? If she had time. Um, like I said, she may have been sitting here at her sewing table um, while Mr. Lincoln was reading from the newspaper. So she could still hear the stories and still kind of make, make uh, comments or file things away for later. Any stories about uh, Abraham and the, and the boys wrestling on the floor or doing other things like that? <laughs> yes, this is definitely the room they would have done that. Um, 
Mr. Lincoln is, for trivia buffs, Mr. Lincoln is the only president in the Wrestling Hall of Fame um, due to his skills mostly at New Salem, but he, he still kept, kept it going a, a little bit with his boys. Um, so you can imagine this could be a very noisy room. If Mr. Lincoln and one of the boys is wrestling on the floor, you know the dog would be barking and the cats are probably scattered to the four winds and, and Mrs. Lincoln would either be cheering them on sometimes or yelling at them to stop it, you know, a lot going on in this room. <laughs> you mentioned the dog a couple of times. Fido, is that the actual name of the dog? That was the last dog they had here. They had dogs throughout their time here, but Fido is kind of the most famous. Um, he's the only one we have a photograph of. Um, we don't know when that photograph was taken, but um, yeah, there, he was a, a yellow mutt is the best description that we have of him. And he looks kind of like a, a mutt in the picture. There's no discernible breed visible, but apparently a very good dog, very loved dog. <laughs> very good. And the picture on the wall here. Oh, okay. The picture on the wall is, was chosen because in the Leslie drawing you can just see a horse's head. So this is a picture with horses. Um, turns out it's a very famous painting in Great Britain. The gentleman who painted it, the original, um, was well known throughout Britain for his portraits of, um, he and his father both, portraits of like racing horses, the famous racing horses, steeplechase, things like that, that's very popular in Britain. Um, so this is one of his first where he doesn't just have the horse. He's created kind of a scene uh, of an English barnyard. So horses, chickens, roosters, ducks. There's a cat on the horse's back, on the dark horse's back. Um, a couple doing typical activities that would be going on in a barn. So a fun painting for all of the family to find something of interest. Something of interest, yes.